Chapter 1 The Aspden and Walmsley Families in Lancashire Both the Aspden and Walmsley families apparently originate in the county of Lancashire, England and are concentrated in the Blackburn Hundred. A hundred is a local court area, consisting of a number of parishes. I have done little investigation into the histories of the families in these areas except to seek some details in the very extensive set of volumes entitled The Victoria Histories of the Counties of England. The history of the county of Lancashire is part of this series and consists of eight large volumes, published in 1911. The earliest mention of any Astons in this history is in 1276 when Richard de Radcliffe and Adam de Asden claimed a tenement a property, in Oswald Twistle against Henry de Lacey and others. They were successful in their claim. The name Aspden apparently derives from the name of the manor in the same area of Oswald Twistle. See figure on page 2, where Oswald Twistle is seen to be about 4 miles east of Blackburn, it is a village. Closer to Miller, which lies about two and a half miles northwest of Blackburn, the history of the county of Lancashire noted that the Aspden family only early stayed in the 16th and 17th centuries. Descendants of the Aspens of Arley and other Aspens are still common in the towns around Blackburn. This is confirmed by Sir William Addison in his book Understanding English Surnames, where he notes, counting names in these Lancashire parish registers only brings out how settled most of the communities must have been over the long periods required for a small population to become one of many thousands. The Aspens and Ainsworths were in strength in Blackburn with the Dewursts close behind them. Many of these surnames began as names of manners now forgotten or little known. Ewan in his book A History of Surnames of the British Isles confirms this with further interesting information, page 330, in some parts of England and Scotland where there is little variety in the surnames, nicknames attain to an added importance, and are officially noticed. In Lancashire parish registers, for instance, entries such as the following were formerly not uncommon, Blackburn parish registers. Thomas Saines were the alias Luck March 17, 1624 John Aspden alias Thick Skin November 4, 1640 Thomas Oswald Eston alias Old Nibson December 22, 1648 The Walmsley family lived in the same area, and members of that name, sometimes the name is spelt Walmsley, owned and occupied estates at Sholey, a mile or so north of Meller on the bank of the River Ribble, and at Duncan, east of Blackburn just north of the village of Church. The Walmsleys of Shoyley had a coat of alms coal and the description of the arms is, gules on a chief firm and two hurts. The colors are red for the gules and blue for the azure. The Walmsleys are noted frequently in the county history, which makes the following observation about the family. The Walmsleys of Shoyley and Duncan Hill no doubt sprang from the parent stock which originally settled at Walmersley in the parish of Berry. A branch of the family was settled in Tockles during the later part of the 14th century and continued there until the 18th century. The name was common among the yeoman class in Amounderness after the 16th century. Amounderness Hundred was adjacent to the Blackburn Hundred, local court area, and included Preston and Blackpool. The county history continues to describe the success in law of Sir Thomas Walmsley at the times of James I and the subsequent problems encountered by his son Richard at the hand of the parliamentary forces during the Civil War. It is likely that the arms shown on the previous figure belong to this family. Our connection with the Walmsleys is much more likely to be through the yeoman side of the family and hence it is very unlikely that any of our forebears had any right to use the arms. The Walmsley name is quite common in New Zealand, certainly much more so than the name Aspden. Auckland has three Walmsley Roads, St. Helliers, Otahuhu and Mangaree Bridge. All of which only emphasizes the difficulty of establishing family connections. While talking in general terms it is worth adding a brief note about the industry in the Blackburn area at the time that Henry Aspden and Alice Walmsley were born. Cotton mills were established in the ideal South Lancashire climate in the middle of the 18th century. In the Blackburn area, the Peel family were dominant. 
Their mills were founded by Robert Peel, who was the grandfather of Sir Robert Peel, English Prime Minister, from 1841 to 1846. His son, father of Sir Robert, Robert Peel, greatly expanded the business and by the end of the 18th century employed some 15,000 workers in various mills. He was an enlightened employer, and when he became a member of parliament was responsible for introducing the first Factory Act in 1802. It should be noted that a more important act, the Cotton Mills Act of 1819 followed, which forbade the labor of children under the age of 9 and reduced the working hours of those under the age of 16 to 72 hours per week. As a footnote to this opening chapter it is worth commenting on the family relationship, if any, to the inventor of Portland cement, one Joseph Aspden of Leeds. There is an interesting account about him and his family in the magazine Concrete of August 1974. Born approximately 1778, he, like his father Thomas, was a bricklayer. He was granted a patent for a superior cement which resembles Portland stone in 1824. As the article about Joseph Aspden states, the name Aspden is a reasonably uncommon one, although there is a quagmire to wade through of past generations' liberal approach to spelling. Records of the Aspens variously feature them as Asden, Aspen, Aspden, Asden, Aspen and the alphabetic index of patenters actually manages Aspen. Without any further information except that there is no significant mention of Aspens or Aspens in the county history of Yorkshire, it is likely that this family in Leeds came there sometime in the 17th or 18th century from the Blackburn area. Hence while there could be common ancestry of Leeds and the Aspens of Miller, it seems apparent that there is no direct connection. That is a pity really because it would be poetic justice for a family linked with the transport of cement in New Zealand to be descended from the inventor of Portland cement. Chapter 2 Henry Aspden and Alice Walmsley in Lancashire According to the Family Bible, Henry Aspden was born in Mellor on January 1, 1818 and Alice Walmsley was born in Blackburn, on December 22, 1830. I know little of their parents or families except that Henry's father is given as James Aspen on Henry's death certificate, and is described as a farmer. I also understand that Henry had a sister Alice who married Thomas Almond. A son of theirs, Henry Almond, emigrated to New Zealand with his wife Elizabeth, Nade Downey around 1901 when he was 39. He had a canning factory in Waikumiti, Auckland for a period. It is also possible that Henry had a brother Thomas, a year or so younger. On one visit to Mellor Churchyard I saw the gravestone of Thomas Aspen, died September 22, 1904 aged 75 years, his wife Nanny, son James and daughters Catherine, Nancy, Esther and Annie. I know even less about Alice Walmsley's family. Her death certificate names her mother as Mary Walmsley, made a name not known, but does not give her father's name. It is unlikely that Henry was fortunate enough to be able to go to school. Certainly he could not write when he came to New Zealand because when was allocated his land at the Maku, at that time he signed as acknowledgement, with a cross. He did learn to write however probably taught by his children, because he signed his will in 1884. It is likely that he went to work in one of the cotton mills in the area as soon as he was nine years old, probably in Blackburn and most likely one owned by the Peel family. Alice may have trained as a nurse or a midwife, but I have no definite information to this effect. However she was a practicing midwife in New Zealand. Henry and Alice must have married around 1850 and evidently moved to Preston about this time. James was born there May 16, 1852. Then followed, two Thomases, born in 1855 and 1857 who both died in infancy. Henry Jr. was born on June 20, 1860 and christened August 5th, that year at St. John's Church in Preston. A map showing Preston in 1824, figure 2, gives the idea of the town that they lived in. The baptism record for the parish church of Preston, Lancashire, St. John's Church, shows that Henry, 
son of Henry and Alice Asden of Church Street, Preston, was baptized on August 5, 1860. It also shows that Henry Sr.'s occupation was weaver. At this time Henry may have risen to be a foreman in the Millad Preston family, oral history would suggest that this was the case. However, it would seem that he could see no future in this work for himself or his boys, and when he learned early in 1864 that the New Zealand government were looking for suitable people, with an agricultural background, to emigrate to New Zealand he applied for a passage for himself and family. He was recruited by Captain William C. Daldy who was then acting as one of the young country's immigration agents. These agents were charged with the following instructions. 1. Instructions to the agent. 2. No persons more than 45 years old or under 16 years unless part of a family are to be selected. 3. No unmarried females unless part of a family are to be selected. 4. In the case of actual necessity, assistance to a trifling extent can be given emigrants before embarkation. 5. Allotments of land here on which emigrants are to be placed will be ready for them on their arrival. 6. House accommodation will be provided for the emigrants, but not necessarily in the vicinity of their land during, say, two months after their arrival. 7. The emigrants will have a choice in the selection of their lots, but the locality will be determined by the government. 8. The government will find employment for them during at least six months. 9. Should there be no employment for the emigrant in the vicinity of his land, he will be permitted to reside elsewhere in the province within which his land is situated. 10. If a person refuses to proceed to this district pointed out to him, he will be liable, in addition to the forfeiture of his land, to the repayment of his passage money. 11. A reasonable proportion of mechanics is to be selected, such as carpenters, blacksmiths, shoemakers etc., but the principal class is to consist of mechanics used to agricultural pursuits. There was obviously no call for mill hands, even if foremen, so Henry, remembering his farm boyhood became a gardener for the purposes of the selection process. This is listed in the land allocation list of the Lancashire which, it was obviously a successful move. It is hard for us to appreciate just how big a step this must have been for him, and his family. While life was not good in the industrial towns of England, there was at least some sort of security, and of course there was the rest of the family. All of this was to be left behind forever, to travel right around the world on a sea voyage lasting more than three months. They may never have seen the sea before to a country inhabited by savages of unknown disposition. It is unlikely that they knew of the fighting between the Maori and Pakea however, let alone that two years before they arrived there had been fighting in the area they were to occupy. All they knew was that there was the prospect of a new life, and the likelihood of owning some land, perhaps envisaged as being rolling green pastures trimmed by hedgerows or dristone fences. Had they known of the trials of bush and swamp, shortage of work and a life in Rapal huts that faced them, it is unlikely that they would have made such a momentous move. Chapter 3 Henry and Alice Aspen in New Zealand Henry and Alice, together with James, aged 12, and Henry Jr., aged 4, traveled to London early in 1865, probably by train, perhaps that was a new experience also. They would have boarded the sailing ship Lancashire Witch in the London docks together with their fellow passengers, all assisted emigrants, a total of 497 joined the ship there. The Lancashire which was quite large for a sailing ship at the time, being 1,575 tons and carried the largest number of passengers to have arrived in Auckland Nun ship up to that time. She sailed from the dock on February 10, 1865 under the command of Captain George King. She passed the start point on February 13th, and reached the equator on March 6th, but made relatively slow passage after that because of light winds. Consequently she did not sight North Cape until June 1st and anchored off North Head on Friday June 2nd at 4pm, 
It was a long journey of 109 days but probably not too unpleasant since no storm seemed to have been encountered. I have found no account of the voyage other than the brief details given in the New Zealand Herald of Saturday June 3, 1865 in Brett's book White Wings. However the latter book does give an excellent account of typical day-to-day -day life on board the ship St. Leonard. Twelve of the passengers died on the voyage, mainly infants, and five were born, so that the number that arrived in Auckland was 490. On arrival in Auckland, and on being cleared by the Port Health Authorities, the family would have been housed in some sort of transit camp together with their fellow passengers. Because the Lancashire which was the 12th of 13 ships to arrive as part of the special Waikato immigration scheme and many of the earlier arrivals were still waiting for their land allocation, Henry, Alice and family may have been put into a camp under canvas to await their turn. When they were allowed to proceed to their allotments in South Auckland, they were coached to Anehunga where they boarded a small ship for the journey across the Manuka Harbour to the Waioku Inlet. Apparently before they left England, it was intended that the emigrants on this ship settle in Northland. However unrest among the Maoris in the north changed the plans and many were located in the South Auckland area instead. Henry was given 10 acres of land in the Maku area and also, probably later, 20 acres of land in Padamanho Township nearby. The Maku land, lots 1 and 13 of section 98, Waioku East, was described on the original survey plan as taking in all of section 98, as follows, the land is of first-rate quality. There are several small springs of water about. The land is flat with the exception of the small hills I have shown. Water may be obtained on any part of the land by sinking from 5 to 15 feet. The forest is also of good quality containing plenty of good puriri, totara, matai and rimu. There are also a few good cowrie trees on numbers 12 and 13. Sounds good, but when the object was to farm, a dense stand of mature trees, even if there were a few corys was the last thing they desired. Their daughter, Mary Alice, confirmed the picture in a brief article which appeared in the New Zealand Herald in 1951 where she said, when they reached their section they found that it was heavy standing bush except for about an acre of raw po swamp. No doubt it came as a great shock. In other cases immigrants refused to stay and fled back to the rough civilization of the nearest town. The family's first task however, was to provide a roof over their heads. This was probably a tent supplied by the authorities to the new settlers. In fairly short order this was followed by a house but from punga trunks, thatched with rawpo and with a dirt floor. This is confirmed by Alice in her article in the New Zealand Herald. It was presumably the house that John Thomas was born in, on February 18, 1867 or perhaps in the house of a slightly better established neighbor. When their first daughter, Mary Alice was born on July 27, 1869, they had obviously improved their situation. She described it thus, The home where I was born was a slab hut of two rooms with a large wooden chimney. Several could sit in it, and the fire was in the middle of the earth floor. But life must have been difficult in those early days. There would have been little living off the land as they cleared the bush. They would have received something for the lumber felt, but with everyone else doing the same it would have been very little. Their main subsistence would have been the wages received for work on government funded work, which had been promised to them. However, with the shortage of money in the government coffers, this was also a most unreliable source of support. This is confirmed by John Horseman in his book The Coming of the Pakea to the Auckland Provence. The bush supplemented their meager rations however, as Mary Alice Smith, my mother did all her baking in a camp oven. She made lovely bread, and roasted the wild ducks, pigeons and wild pig, which was about the only meat we had in those days when I was a child. Their isolation at that time added further difficulties particularly for medical needs. 
John Horseman commented that medical attention was almost non-existent and women who had nursing experience were at a premium. I seem to remember being told that Alice Aspen had been a nurse in Blackburn. Certainly she served as a midwife in the Malku area as described by Mary Alice in a little anecdote, which also underlines the sort of people our forebears were. One day my mother was called to attend to a neighbor one or two miles away in a confinement, the nearest doctor being in Auckland, some 35 miles away. On her return through a track in the bush she became lost. It was thick dense bush, and, as there was no light she had no hope but to make the best of it for the night. So she made herself as comfortable as she could until the next day, when she found her way home. During the early years there was also the fear that the conflict with the Maoris, which was still taking place in the Waikato and elsewhere, as described later in these notes, would spread back north and the settlers would again be forced from their land. During the late 60s and 70s the British government gradually withdrew its regiments in New Zealand and the government adopted its self-reliant policy, but it did not help the peace of mind of the settlers. Many of the settlers were organized into militia or armed constabulary. Edith Hooks, daughter of James Archibald and Ellen Aspden, tells that her grandfather, James Aspden, was a drummer boy in the Maori Wars, 1866. This would make him 14 years old. Schooling was a problem too, but it was not long before schools began to appear. The Auckland Provincial Council passed an act in 1857 to promote education. This act required the schools receiving aid from the council to provide instruction in reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, geography, history, English grammar and the theory and practice of vocal music according to the age and understanding of the pupils. Girls also could be taught needlework. It is understood that the first school at Maku may have been in Ikaufari, but the New Zealand Herald of Friday, September 21, 1866 described the opening of a school in the Presbyterian Church Hall at Maku, a few days earlier. The first schoolmaster, Mr. M. C. Key, was described as an exceedingly well-qualified young man. Presumably Henry Jr. attended this school. The first Methodist service to be conducted by an ordained minister was held at Moku on Sunday, May 14, 1865. Conducted by the relevant John Rishworth, who rode in from Waioko to conduct the event. In 1873 the school at Moku, with Mr. G. H. Maunders as teacher, came under the control of the education board. Probably John Thomas, Tom, was a foundation pupil and both Mary Alice and Margaret, born at Moku on July 26, 1874, followed in their time. Church too, was a very important part of life for the settlers. The first church established in the Moku area was the famous St. Bride's Church, Anglican, which was the scene of some fierce fighting during the Waikato War, notably October 23, 1863. The land for the church was donated by Shaw Savia Limited and the first service was held in 1861. The Aspdens were of strong Wesleyan stock, however. At Miller, the Methodist chapel was erected in 1802, whereas St. Mary's Episcopal Church opened in 1829. When the family arrived at the Maku they found that the Methodist church had been operating since earlier that year, May 14, 1865 with services being held in the homes of the settlers. Avril Lambert who provided most of this information about the churches, understands that all of Henry's children, as well as James I too, attended the Sunday school there. Later when the families moved to Auckland they were regular attendants at the Pitt Street Methodist Church. The family managed to survive the early years and improved their situation as time progressed. During the 70s, First James, around 1870, and Henry Jr., at least by 1878, acquired land in the area. Horseman describes these years well, the years which followed were ones of steady progress though there were still hard times in the 80s. 
with more adequate roading and with the opening of the railway from Drury to Mercer in 1875, the future of the region was assured. The land was peaceful, the soil was fertile and there was a market for produce in Auckland. It is not possible to generalize, but most of the settlers now had capital with which to develop their farms and in the towns there was the start of industrial development. Flour mills, flax mills and dairy factories were the chief industries of the time. In 1882 a return of freeholders was prepared. It showed, occupation land value asked N. Henry Farmer, Moku 30 acres in Manuka County. 250 pounds. Asked N. Henry Jr. Farmer, Moku 46 acres. 150 pounds. Asked N. James Farmer, Moku 46 acres. 150 pounds. However, the passing years of hard toil must have been telling on Henry's health and in 1883 or 1884, when Henry was either 55 or 56 he and Alice left Moaku and moved to Auckland. A property at 19 Jail Road, Mount Eden, obviously in the shadow of the somber walls of the prison, was purchased on July 31, 1883. The house shown in the photograph was built by Henry, no doubt with help from his sons and others. The street name was changed to Boston Road around 1890. Henry Asp Den died March 25, 1892 at the age of 64. Alice lived on in Boston Road. Tom married in 1891, Alice married Randolph Smith in 1893 and Margaret married George William Turley in 1896. Margaret and William Turley lived next door to Alice in Boston Road for a time. When Henry and Anna, Hannah, moved into Kingsland, Alice, in failing health, left Boston Road and stayed with them. She died there, at 3rd Avenue, Kingsland on July 9, 1905, aged 75. Her passing was greatly mourned by family and friends, because as Edith Cooper says, of her long life of service to her family and neighbors far and near. Chapter 4 James Aspden and Family Notes by Avril Lambert James was born on May 16, 1852 in Preston, Lancashire, the eldest child of Henry and Alice Aspden. When his parents decided to emigrate to New Zealand, James was 12 years old. Probably he had already been working for three years since the age of nine, when English law permitted children to start work. Consequently he would have joined his father in clearing the land for farming as soon as the family arrived at their property in the Moku. Family hearsay also credits him with being a drummer boy for the army when he was 14. Presumably this was when the soldiers were camped in a district near Moku. It might also be assumed that for a young lad of that age, the role of soldier was much more attractive than wielding an axe on the family property. His own original land grant was 10 acres adjacent to his parents' land grant and both were farmed as one unit. A few days before his 24th birthday, James married Jemima Fraser on May 11, 1876. She was just 18, and the youngest daughter of their neighbors, the Frasers, who were leaving the district to settle in Auckland. See Chapter 9. Their first child James Archibald asked N known as Archie, was born February 5, 1877. Their first daughter, Emily, arrived August 4, 1878, followed by Henry, known as Harry, on June 23, 1880, and finally Alice on June 2, 1882. All the children were born at Maku. A government land document of 1882 showed James Aspden owning 46 acres valued at 150 pounds at the time. Tragically, Jemima died September 5, 1883 from kidney failure which her death certificate records she had suffered from for 10 months. She died at East Street, Newton. Perhaps it was at a relative's house, or was it a small nursing home? for there were two nurses listed in the street in 1883. The baby, Alice, was but 15 months old and Emily just five. Archie was six and Harry three years. 
probably Jemima was unable to care for the children for some time before she died. It was a very sad and difficult period for James and his four young children. Did his mother, Alice, step in to fill the gap? Family history is not forthcoming on this point. Archie and Emily were sent to a boarding school near Orin Grafton Road. Perhaps Harry stayed with his grandparents, not yet being of school age. Baby Alice was taken by a kind woman, and Tate Papaya, apparently not a relative, until James remarried. It seems that Alice may have been with this foster mother for quite a long time before Jemima died, because family oral history says she was only three months old when she was parted from her own family. Emily remembered herself, Archie and Henry sitting on the steps of their home in Upper Queen Street watching their father, plastering the pillars on the Baptist tabernacle. Presumably this was in late 1883 or early 1884 as the finishing touches were being made to the building, for the church was dedicated in 1884. 